Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Citrin, and I am so pleased to be talking with Brad Smith of Microsoft today. I want to say hello to everybody in the room munching on a burrito. Hello to everybody in our Bizarro World Mirror Room in 3018, where they are also munching on burritos and I think watching us with only a nanosecond delay. Um, uh, not Howard Stern length, but just uh, truly the electron uh, getting there. And to those on the internet also watching our uh, live stream. And for that, I should open with a warning that by now and given our topic should be rote. You are being watched at all times. Anything you say can and will be used against you. But we welcome your participation um, uh, once we get to the question and answer part. Um, we have microphones uh, for those in the room uh, when we hit that part of things. For those not in the room, uh, there is the hashtag trust in tech um, for Twitter or whatever other instrumentality you might be using. And I think Shailen Thomas over here, Intrepid Research Associate, um, is ready to drive on this screen to anything that we might mention, and we're trusting in Shailen to do that right. In fact, I think in honor of Brad's visit, we're going to use Bing instead of, <laughs> I for, forget the name of that other search engine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We've been there using Bing. Yeah, yeah. So we're going we're gonna to try that out and see what happens. Um, and uh, we should get right into it. So I should say, uh, Back in the earliest days, I was a Texas Instruments computer aficionado, because why not have your computer be the people that made your watch? But um, <laughs> later on, uh, I uh, uh, interned in the summer of 1990 at Microsoft. And uh, those were the days Bill Gates was the richest man in the world with $4 billion. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a lot these days, somehow, when the uh, Fortune uh, rankings. And uh, I guess the order of the day then was uh, Windows 3.1, right. Office, that sort of thing. And Brad, you were there really from those early days. You started in 1993 at Microsoft. That's right. Is that right? Yes. I do remember I was uh, possibly interested, uh, given my enjoyment of computers, but also potentially of law. I said, well, could Microsoft put me through law school? And in exchange, I'll um, work for Microsoft. And the answer came back. We have two types of people at Microsoft, developers and support staff. Like, if you're going to code for us, great. If not, we don't want to talk to you. But things have changed since then? Well, first of all, that was clearly our loss. Well, uh, you, you'd be sitting here, and I'd be interviewing you. Uh -huh. it's, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, certainly things have changed. Uh, yeah, I've been at the company for 21 years. I've been in this job for a little over 12. And I think what is perhaps one of the really interesting things about the uh, the year 2014 is you know we're just seeing so many issues that really involve the intersection of technology and policy technology and law technology and regulation uh, we're seeing this in the United States we're seeing this uh, around the world um, you know lawyers have been playing in a, an important role you know, since you know among other things you know intellectual property and antitrust issues really exploded in the 1990s but to the range of issues today um, is just more varied than ever. So um, really today we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between companies like Microsoft and governments around the world, first and foremost the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if in, uh, along your tenure at Microsoft, was there a moment when it felt like a sea change in the reasons the government was knocking on Microsoft's door? Well, there, um, there have been many sea changes over the years. Uh, I think there was a sea change after 9-11. That's the first sea change that I think is relevant to this. Um, as I mentioned, I started in this job in 2002. It was July of 2002. And um, you know, there's a lot of things that you know, one uh, cannot talk about because of national security obligations. But there are more things that one can talk about, frankly, because certain documents have become public. Uh, over the last 18 months. You're talking about the Snowden leaks. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and one of the documents we have talked about publicly uh, is an NSA Inspector General report that was published uh, by The Guardian last year. Uh, and this recounts a voluntary program um, that the NSA had pursued uh, after 9-11. It had gone out and basically asked uh, telecommunications and internet companies, in effect, to provide voluntary bulk uh, is this the so-called PRISM collection. program you're talking about? Well, it, it's to the... Uh, the, the cat is so far out yeah, of the bag. The, to the best of my knowledge, <laughs> you know, 
PRISM is probably, I don't know for sure, I think PRISM is a name that the NSA used internally for its database. Um, I don't think PRISM was the name for this, but you know, as this... Ah, this it, is actually a really interesting point, because as this stuff gets reported in the press, it, it things get changed around. Yeah, it gets so, yeah, um, got it. And I think Shailen may be daring to look at... Um, you might be able to find a Guardian story in 2013, um, I believe it was in July uh, or August, um, that talks about an NSA IG or Inspector General report. Um, this is also known as FAA 702. Is that the authority under which this program is done? It, 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 it may be. I, the Inspector General report uh, doesn't talk about the legal authority for it. Um, in many ways, what the, this document you know, says, and this is where things can be happening behind me and I won't know it, um, <laughs> but, but what the document says is that the, the NSA had gone out and asked companies on a voluntary basis, not pursuant to subpoena or court order, uh, to provide access in bulk to communications records, you know, including emails. And uh, you know, the, there, there's an appendix to this document, when you get to it, that talks about companies A through H. Uh, and the companies are not listed by name, but one could read through them. And you know, there was one that was pretty clearly us, uh, because it talked about the discussions that had taken place with the company's Department of Legal and Corporate Affairs. Uh, and uh, it, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we were the only company in our industry in 2002 that had a department by that name. LCA. Yeah. And basically what the, the report notes is that the, uh, that the request came to provide access in bulk, uh, the lawyers got involved, and the company turned the government down. Uh, and you know, th that was an important moment. That, you know, it, we all go to so many meetings over our lives that you don't remember most of them. Um, I do remember a meeting in the fall of 2002 with our CEO, there were only three of us in the room, and we talked about what was the principle that was going to guide us. And you know, there were two factors that were important then, um, and they were important to me, they were important to the Microsoft, and I believe they remain important today. First, I thought we had to take a long view. You know, it was easy in 2002 to say, wow, the heat of the moment, we have to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do. Um, and so in that conversation with Steve Ballmer, our CEO, you know, I found myself talking about John Adams, uh, about Franklin Roosevelt, about Abraham Lincoln. He was an intern in 91 at Microsoft? <laughs> yeah. 81. Yeah. yeah, he did shrink to fit on yeah. Excel. And, and you just see, yeah, but, but the real lesson is over time, the pendulum swings, you've got to take the long view. And I think when you take the long view, the principle that it led us to is, if we are legally obligated to do something, well, of course, we will comply. But if we are not, we won't. Because what we're dealing with here is the balance between public safety and personal privacy. And certainly in countries that have democratic governments, it just seemed right that the balance between privacy and safety should be struck by the government. And the right way for the government to strike the balance is through its democratic processes through Congress, and our basic message was if the government didn't feel the law went far enough, it, it shouldn't ask us to go beyond the law. It should go to Congress and ask Congress to change the so law. So let me just uh, test out this principle, because it's very clearly enunciated um, across a range of possibilities. Um, I understand that Facebook appears to have a program by which it automatically scans and monitors internal Facebook messaging and if the AI there determines that somebody is in the process of grooming a child on Facebook for potential um, uh, abuse, it will then be referred to a human, potentially referred to the police. Would this principle apply differently in that kind of situation? Um, you actually, it's interesting that you go there, Jonathan, because I do think that there is one area across the tech sector where people probably feel more comfortable and even more need to go farther, and that's the, the area of child pornography. And you, know, you can have a robust legal discussion about the extent of one's legal obligation. It's actually quite broad you know, to turn over to the authorities uh, clear-cut evidence of child uh, pornography. Um, what you, it really then leads to is, is one going to look, because when one looks and one finds, you do often tend to trigger these obligations. And you know, even on a global basis, 
Um, you know, child pornography is an, is an issue that has you know, focused you know, more governments, um, more private sector NGOs, um, more tech companies on trying to, to, to come together just because, frankly, it's a problem that had almost been eradicated before the internet. Uh, the internet brought child pornography, unfortunately, back to life. Mostly, I would say that the, the, the work is done consistently with the principle uh, because laws are so far reaching and the obligations they create on companies to turn over things that they are aware of. And uh, in that meeting you were talking about with Balmer as you're considering the government's request for voluntary cooperation, the principle you offer is a prudential or values-based one. Were there countervailing legal considerations about worrying that you'd be violating your own privacy policy, for example, if you voluntarily turn stuff over? You, you, you definitely could get, I'll just say, um, stuck in the mud uh, in a variety of legal issues that would cut both ways. Uh -huh. um, you know, what are the issues with respect to your privacy policies if you turn things over? What are the issues under different uh, other laws if you, if you don't? Um, you know, but ultimately none of them uh, were then, in my opinion, or really are now necessarily, um, you know, something that operates in such a way as to, to trump the basic principle. Um, you know, the right place for the balance to be yes. struck is by governments themselves. So in this meeting in 2002, mm -hmm. you articulated the principle, turned the government away from the request for voluntary cooperation. Did they return? <laughs> Well, let me just say this. Um, there have been lots of conversations with governments over the years, not just the US government, but other governments as well. Um, I believe the principle is one that we have and can apply in a very steadfast way. Uh -huh. um, and, and I find, you know, we have a new CEO, Satya Nadella. Um, you know, Satya very much is just a, what I'd call a principled leader. He wants to know when we're making tough calls, what are the principles that are going to guide us? Uh, and you know, we keep coming to this principle. Uh, you know, obviously, if we're legally complied to do something, um, we need to do it. Um, but if somebody is asking us to go beyond the law because they don't think the law goes far enough, then we say, look, you're in government. You're in a leadership position. Why don't you go change the law? Now, I suppose the law is not always utterly clear-cut, or the, president, uh, the, the administration or, or law enforcement uh, will represent an authority. They'll issue the subpoena. In private cases, subpoenas can come off a little roll of subpoenas, like deli tickets, and hand it over. Then there's a question of, well, do we want to push back? Do we right. want the courts to weigh in? And how do you, does the principle help with those kinds of decisions? Uh, it generally does. It's like, you know, it's like all principles in life. It doesn't answer every question that may arise. Going back to your question, sea changes. I'd say there was a sea change after 9-11. That's understandable. There was a sea change in the last 18 months after the documents <clears throat> were leaked by Edward Snowden. Um, that was, that created another sea change. Um, people had to go back. We, we had to go back, everybody had to go back. Are, are we really comfortable with everything we're doing? How are we gonna deal with this? Um, you know, even to the extent that we felt we'd been making the right decisions, the public's trust on a global basis was changed. Uh, and it's not the same in every country, but I've found in, say, in Germany, across Europe, in Brazil, even I've been surprised in talking to large businesses in Japan. You know, the, all of this is, is a question and a concern. And are there ways, by the way, to measure that? I know it was, I think, maybe David Kirkpatrick who wrote a piece um, that was like, thanks, U.S. government, you've just destroyed Silicon Valley. And I don't know, how is that overplayed a little bit? Or well, uh, I was there two weeks ago. It hadn't been destroyed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the basic point, I think, is nonetheless valid. Um, yeah, we, we do certain testing ourselves. I mean, we do certain polling around the world. Um, on just people's attitudes on technology. We do it among consumers. We do it among you know, people who are in government and academia and the like. And one of the things we ask is trust. And we ask about trust in technology. Uh, we ask about trust in you know, different companies' uh, technology. And um, what we found over the last year that I found most interesting was in Germany, uh, in Brussels, uh, in Brazil, 
uh, we saw basically a 10 to 15 point decline in trust. So a, a double digit fall. In and trust. this is specific to American companies or just to technology generally? I, I think it is uh, technology in general, but it's heavily focused on Because technology companies. in general, the answer might be like, you'll be back. But American companies, it might mean they have a choice and that could Well, be... yeah, although so many of the leading technologies come from American companies that it, it's a little hard to, to tease that uh, apart, although certainly one can. Got it. But going back to then your point, well, well, what does this mean for law, for lawyers, you know, th that kind of thing? Um, when we sat down as a company last November and we were looking at what we were going to do, we did one thing that every company in the uh, tech sector has done, and I think it's a good and important thing, and that's to you know, strengthen encryption. Um, we did another thing that no other company has done, uh, and we said we'd use our legal resources. And specifically, um, we would implement two contractual changes uh, in our enterprise contracts, meaning contracts with businesses, governments, NGOs, Harvard, and the like. Uh, we said that if the US government came and served a subpoena on us, seeking the email or other records of an enterprise customer, we would resist that, we would go to court, we would argue to a federal judge that that subpoena ought to be served on the customer, not on us. Second, we said that if the data in question were stored exclusively outside the United States, we would go to court and we would challenge the extraterritorial reach of the warrant that was being used, for example, to reach that. And so you want to talk about a sea change. You know, I, I sort of spent my earlier years you know, defending lawsuits brought by the government. And over the last year, we have brought three lawsuits against the government. First, seeking to publish more information about the kind of national security letters we were, we were getting, FISA orders. And these might be orders that carry with them uh, an obligation not to tell anybody about they them. They all had uh, these kinds of obligations. And we asserted a First Amendment right. And Microsoft and Google really uh, worked very closely. We both we sued within days of each other, which was more coincidence. But once we got going, we negotiated with the government together. The second lawsuit was to challenge an FBI subpoena that was uh, issued late last year uh, of an enterprise customer. And the third lawsuit was the lawsuit that we filed in the Southern District of New York that's going up to the Second Circuit that seeks email data that resides in our data center in Ireland. So we should walk through each of these. Um, in the case of requests that bear with them an insistence that you not tell anybody about it, What's your instinct about the future of that kind of thing? And has Microsoft experimented with such things as warrant canaries or other ways to, prior to receiving something, announcing we haven't gotten anything, and then once you get it, you simply stop talking and the canary in the coal mine has expired? Um, I don't know that we have you know, thought about it quite that way. Um, you know, there certainly are statements that we've made that I've made about certain things we've never received. And you know, the day that I stop saying that, you're right. The canary will. That sounds will be a lot heard. like a. Yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's. You know, frankly, that's not what has led us down that path. It's Anything you want to tell us today? Well, sure. I mean, it actually relates to that second lawsuit. I am yes. I, I, uh, challenging an FBI subpoena. Uh, I have I have said repeatedly, and I can continue to say today that to this day. We have never turned over or been forced to turn over the uh, data of an enterprise customer without first notifying that enterprise customer, giving that enterprise customer's legal department the opportunity to decide what it wanted to do and, and going to court uh, and challenging it. And you know, the only case that's been public uh, was the one that was brought last November. It was brought in the Western District of Washington in federal court in Seattle. Um, and to date, uh, what has been unsealed is the fact that we moved to quash the FBI subpoena and the FBI uh, withdrew the subpoena. Um, there are other aspects of the case that remain under seal. And um, can you share some of the dynamics in thinking between extending these sorts of commitments to enterprise customers versus what must be a quantumly larger commitment to do to run-of-the-mill consumers? but. Could a consumer check a box and become an enterprise customer, or what? T talk about the distinction there. Um, you know, interestingly, the case that we have uh, in New York regarding data in the data center in Ireland does involve a consumer. Uh, yeah, I think that when you, you don't move to change your contracts, for example, 
uh, until you know that you, of course, can comply with that contractual obligation. So you've got to have the technical capability to decide, for example, where you're going to store something uh, and then be able to implement that on a global basis. Um, we, you know, we've made clear that from an enterprise uh, customer perspective, you know, we have that in Europe. We're very close to having that worldwide. You know, basically what it means you need to do, for example, for, uh, for let's just say Harvard University's email, or let's, let's call it Trinity College in Ireland, um, you, know, you, you basically have to have two data centers in a certain region. One to store uh, the email where it's going to be accessed by the customer, and the other to back it up. You know, because we want to back up the customer's email as well. You want those two places to be you know, somewhat geographically uh, uh, apart from each other. You know, if there's an earthquake, you, know, you don't want the two data centers to be across the street from each other. You know, so for our European customers, you know, we operate the data center in Ireland, we back it up in Amsterdam. Uh, and so I, we can do that, for example, for enterprise customers in, in Europe. There are many more customers we're increasingly able to do it for one doesn't actually you know, implement it broadly until you can do it everywhere. So I'm, I'm really eager to talk about that, but I just wanted to close yeah. one open parenthesis back on just the notification of subpoenas and such. Um, if I'm a consumer and I say, I'd like to be told if my data has been uh, requested, I'd like uh, the company <coughs> that I'm engaging with for cloud storage or something to tell the government they've got to come to me if they want it. I'm just curious the dynamics of trying to extend the enterprise promise to the consumer space. Um, I, I think it's a really good and interesting question, and I think that there may be areas where it can be done, and there may be areas where it's much more difficult. Hmm. Um, you, you can certainly think about it from a geographic standpoint. You know, can you offer the citizens of one country some assurance that um, that governments in other countries are not going to be able to, to reach their email, their text messages, their photos, and the like. Um, at the same time, can you ever uh, you know, assure, you know, could we ever assure the residents of Massachusetts that they will be, uh, be beyond the reach of law enforcement in Massachusetts? No. I mean, yeah, that's just the but way in law the Massachusetts works. example, what you're telling Harvard in Massachusetts is, if law enforcement comes a knocking yeah. and Harvard is using SharePoint and a right. server at Microsoft, you're going to try to direct the cops over to Microsoft. And I think yes, and I think the distinction is this: Look, everybody who goes to Harvard Law School knows that you know corporations, um, you know, can engage in wrongdoing. They can uh, engage in, in criminal activity, even. Um, but fundamentally, when it comes to public safety, you know, when it comes to uh, investigating violent crimes, when it comes to investigating potential or actual acts of terrorism, you are at the end of the day looking at the acts of individuals. Ah, so it's not like there's a corporation on a rampage in Worcester. We want to look at its email. That, that's right. And, and if you really want to you know, keep peeling the layers of the onion, you do get these questions about what happens if you, quote, get you know, somebody sign up for an enterprise account that really is a criminal enterprise. Um, you know, and, and that's why we've tried to confine it in a clear-cut way to a uh -huh. set of contracts that legitimate businesses and Got NGOs it. are using. Great. All right, consider that parenthesis closed. Let's go back to the geographic case in the Ireland example. Does that mean then that an enterprise customer can basically check a box and say, I would like the data that I generate under this contract to be stored in Amsterdam, wherever the company is? Could Harvard ask for an Amsterdam storage? Um, what we tend to do, I, I actually don't know if, if, mm. if Har Harvard could, um, you know, we, we basically you know, say we're going to look at your nationality. And what we do is we say, you know, if you say you're European, I guess I've Harvard probably could not, unless it wants to change. It has pretensions, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically what we allow people to do is choose their own their own country or their own region. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah, you know, obviously you've got to have a technical architecture and a data center uh, set of investments that makes this feasible. Um, yes. You know, we've said in the loss in the in the court papers in New York, you know, that we now have over a hundred data centers in over forty countries. Uh, and you know we're we're moving um, you know towards uh, a, a world where we you know can basically offer customers uh, soon on a worldwide basis the opportunity the ability to store the data you know in their own country or region. Amazon's basically doing the same thing, by the way. So is the nut of the argument you're making in the case involving the data in Ireland maybe less about where the bits actually repose? 
and more about the entity on whose behalf the bits are stored and the, the citizenship of that entity, the business, it, it's saying that that entity is far away. You shouldn't be able to get to that in these data just because we happen to be an American company? I think there's something to what you're saying, and I think these two concepts come together. Um, you know, because if this were an exercise, and then and, and people do you know, sort of criticize our point of view sometimes by saying, look, you're, you're enabling Americans to evade the law by pretending that they're Irish. Um, you know, what we're really trying to do is, is let people who live in a certain part of the world, uh, who live under the laws of that uh, part of the world, uh, you know, have their data and have their rights uh, in effect governed by their, their own laws and their own government. So that would avoid the convergence that I assume the other side, uh, the government side, would raise, which is, well, if you listen to Microsoft's argument, then any enterprise customer can tick a box, say, I'm in Iceland, and then suddenly it's Icelandic law all day long. You're saying that's not necessarily the case because if the enterprise is Harvard, yeah. then maybe uh, there wouldn't be as much cause to fight back against a, an American subpoena to Microsoft for Harvard's data in Iceland? Yeah, well, I think a, a way to, to restate the, the question that you're getting at is, for example, when should the United States government be able to reach into another country, into a data center built in another country, to get the data inside? Uh, and, you know, and, and, and analogize back to sort of state laws, tort laws, minimum contacts, et, et, et cetera. Um, you know, it, one could understand a rule that would say that if you have an American citizen or resident that is storing data in another place, you know, what one could imagine a public policy rationale um, that would enable the U.S. government to serve a warrant uh, and get that approved by a, a magistrate in the United <coughs> States and reach that. Um, that stands in sharp contrast to the current position that the Department of Justice is taking in our lawsuit. They're basically saying, look, if the data center was built or is operated by an American company, they can reach anything inside. And yeah, I just think that that really goes to the heart of sovereignty. You know, it basically means that whenever an American company builds a building in another country, that suddenly that building is subject to the sovereign reach of the United States government. And you know, the, the UK government has followed this path. The parliament amended its law in July to say that whenever a company that does business in the United Kingdom you know, has data in another country, uh, the, the British government can issue a warrant. Yes. And you know, the, the, it, these things look one way I find when I'm talking to people in London or Washington, D.C., and they're, and, and they're saying, of course we want to reach other places and trust us, we'll only do it when we really need it. Um, but you know, Alibaba is going to build a data center in the United States, isn't it? You know, who's, you know, everybody knows a year from now, if somebody wants to buy eBay, it might be possible to buy it. If somebody wants to buy PayPal, it might be possible to, to buy it. Um, you know, there are technology companies around the world. How will people in Washington, D.C. feel if the Chinese government, the Russian government, the Iranian government, the North Korean government, or pick the government of your choice decides simply to follow the principle that has been advocated by the U.S. government? suddenly the rights of Americans are no longer be, being protected by their own law. They're subject to a whole bunch of other laws. You can imagine the first thing, if that were to come about, uh, Congress would probably happily do, right? They'd break the gridlock for 10 minutes to do that, which would be to say, oh, by the way, if the Chinese government comes knocking, you are not permitted to give data that is under U.S. jurisdiction over to the Chinese. Does that then put the company into a bind where you have two sovereigns with opposite requirements and you don't know what to do? I do think that this is where one creates a real risk of fostering chaos on the internet. Uh, and you, know, you, you end up with these potential conflicts of laws, conflicts between governments. Uh, you know, and in the first instance, technology companies will be put in the, in the middle of an irreconcilable tension between you know, two different governments. But I, I think that, frankly, more important than what it means for technology companies is what it means for people. You know, are people going to continue to be able to have the confidence that their rights are going to be protected by their own constitution or, and by their own laws? 
or is it going to be something that can be overridden by other governments yeah. and other and their laws? Well, this starts to get at the reasons why the enterprise space must be so much easier to figure some of this stuff out in. If you have a, a user using Outlook Live or something, <clears throat> In order to figure out how to respond to a subpoena from a country about that person's email, do you need to know where that person is, where the person may not have specified, the person may not have any identity offered up to Microsoft there? Um, and then does it somehow matter where, the again, the data is stored? Well, that email happens to be parked in this data center, and therefore... I, I think what you're taking us back to is sort of how, what are the factors that should be used to decide how far a government's jurisdiction can reach? Yes. And you're basically pointing to two factors that you know, are sort of well known, nationality and location. Yes. And, you know, I, Neither I, of which hotpants15 at live.com has <laughs> offered up. No, and, and, and both of which may be, uh, you know, well, the, the data will be stored somewhere. Uh, and you know the nationality may be discernible one way or another, including oftentimes by people who come from uh, you know a law enforcement agency. You know it's not like the email address they come uh, looking at necessarily comes out of the blue. Um, you know they may know exactly who that person. So we have is. reason to think this person is located in the United States. Therefore, cough it up. Versus we think this person is in Ireland. Please cough it up. Correct. And if you look at the factual record in our case in New York. Um, which is now, because it's up on appeal, basically com complete. The U.S. government has never once offered a point of view uh, on where this individual resides or this person's nationality, which I think one could reasonably infer um, probably means the person's not American and doesn't reside in the United States because those would be two very helpful facts for the U.S. government's case seeking to apply jurisdiction. And if the Irish then want with their process to get information about Hot Pants 15. And they, is the idea is if they offer up evidence that the person, I guess isn't Irish, is in Ireland, is physically the in, in Ireland. Ireland. The data's in Ireland. Yeah, the, whether the person, it goes back to the, the, one of those two factors, location. Um, but that again, that makes me wonder, will we see in the future when I sign up for a free email account, where would you like your data stored? Mm -hmm. And you just check the box that says Ghana. Yeah, and which, which is why I think you, 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 one needs to think about two things. One is, is one comfortable with a government applying its own extraterritorial unilateral reach to get data of its own citizens? Yeah, I, I would recognize that there's um, you know, a public policy rationale that you know, tends to go in that direction. This is something that's being discussed you know, now by you know, civil rights, civil liberties groups yes. uh, you know, in, in D.C. and others. Uh, you know, Senators Hatch and Coons and Heller have introduced uh, legislation in the Senate um, that would largely affirm uh, the approach we're taking in our lawsuit, but give the U.S. government the ability to reach unilaterally through a warrant for data of American citizens or residents. So, so that's one piece of this. But it also goes to something else that I just think is of paramount importance. What we need is a new generation of international agreements between governments. You know, it's Something not, to replace the letters rogatory right now yeah. that Brazil has been asked to prepare at great expense if it wants to look up something yeah, uh, in the company? The, what, what one quickly finds when one gets into this realm of the discussion is that it leads one to these arcane terms, letters rogatory, you know, MLATs, the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties, that mostly had their origins in the 1800s. Um, and they, at one level, serve a very valuable purpose. It's one of the reasons we've relied on them uh, and, and insisted that governments use them at times because basically a law enforcement agency in one country, you know, to take advantage of it with the U.S., you know, has to take it to the U.S. Embassy and the Justice Department looks at it uh, and then decides whether it's going to get served on an American in the United States. And it's a good filter, frankly, to protect human rights issues, among other things. But the criticism of it is it's slow. Uh, and I think one needs to have a certain sympathy with the fact that we live in a world where law enforcement needs to move faster as well. Um, and what we need is 
if not a new generation of MLATs, I think what we may need is simply a new legal tool that does not exist today. Yes. And just think about the experiences that we've all had, you know, basically over the last 13 years. You know, there was a time after 9-11 when it took a long time to go through an airport security check. Um, and they managed to invent something, you know, called pre-check. Um, look at what is being done when you come into the United States even now with global entry. You know, if we can figure out how to enable people to come across the border in a way that is both faster but ensures proper legal safeguards, can't we find a way to do this between governments when they are seeking information that is necessary? Yes, it's just, it's just so interesting that, as you say, the law may differ between Palo Alto and Paris quite mm -hmm. a lot. And I know you've spoken on the desire that companies shouldn't be above the law. They need to exist within the law of the countries they choose to operate in. Um, and that's surely been illustrated in the conversation we've been having. It is just interesting that that provides both some layer of protection that as an American citizen might prevent other countries from demanding information Microsoft has about me very easily. Um, and perhaps as an Irish citizen, or non-American citizen prevents the American government from getting data uh, particularly easily, although we should explore that more. Um, it does, though, mean that more and more it might matter who is the person on whom the data is sought and what sure. country are they in, which is not something typically offered, at least in the consumer versus enterprise space, right? You're right, and I think it points to um, you know, how this whole issue is evolving. And you know, certainly we've been trying to take steps to what I'll call stand up for people's rights, move quickly, um, but at the same time move thoughtfully. Yes. You know, which means you know, address first something that can be done and then you move from that to, to, to the next issue. And then what one finds is people conjure up all the problems. Yes. Well, MLATs won't work. Well, you know, we, we won't know who people are, blah, blah, blah. Yes. At the end of the day, I think it goes back to one of the simplest things in life. Look, all problems are insurmountable if you don't try to solve them. And you know, no one's trying to solve the MLAT problem. The White House is not yet doing what I believe it needs to do to lead the government rather than delegate everything to the Department of Justice. We need a White House that will lead the government's efforts to solve this problem across borders. And the fact that certain things today are well known, there are well established habits, they may even work well and easily for law enforcement, doesn't mean that the alternative needs to be hard. It just means that one needs to focus on it. Yes. And what we need to do from Palo Alto to DC to frankly Paris and Brussels is get people to talk together about how to solve some of these problems. I'd like to quickly explore two other areas before we uh, open it up. The first is probably best represented by Apple's uh, heralded and made big news feature, got Jim Comey, director of the FBI, upset feature where uh, your four digit code protecting your iPhone uh, will encrypt the data so that if it gets into the hands of law enforcement, it's much harder for them to simply slurp the data out. I'm curious your view on those sorts of solutions that offer promises, whether to enterprise or consumer customers, not about legal defenses that might mm -hmm. be mounted, but about innately working the technology. So even if the warrant is served and the intermediary, in this case Microsoft, turns over the data, good luck, the data is encrypted. I'm curious how much you're thinking about those sorts of solutions and what any company should be thinking about as it implements them. Well, I, I think everybody in the tech sector is thinking about this a lot. And you can see the logical sequence. Uh, it starts with stronger encryption. Uh, you focus on encryption so, for so-called data at rest uh, and for data in transit. Then the next step in, in that discussion is who has the keys to decrypt the content. Um, and you know, what Apple said for the new iPhone, or, or frankly what we've had for Windows BitLocker, uh, is that we don't need the keys. You can have the keys. Uh, you know, and now, of course today, but the, the thing that the iPhone and the BitLocker encryption have in common is its device side encryption. That works as long as the content's not backed up in the cloud. So if you're using an I, iPhone, but you know, you're, you're backing things up in iCloud, you know, it still e exists 
in a form that Apple can access it and be forced to access it pursuant to, say, a, a warrant. And that might be because there's services that the company wants to offer around it. Uh, because if there weren't, if it were really just a backup, the whole point would be it could be a copy of the encrypted phone and you'd be done. Or what I think it really does is it points to what's the next step that one will mm. take if one's a technology company trying to give people the ability to protect their content from these kinds of, of, of legal warrants or subpoenas. Well, you, you then have to figure out how to decrypt data in the data center, in the cloud, in a way where you don't have the keys. Now, right. To run a search on an encrypted corpus and have the results go back to the user, but again, not be helpful to the company. Yeah, or the individual might be able to decrypt their own data because yes. they have the key. What it really causes one to ask and think hard about is another element of this that I think has been um, underappreciated in the public discussion. Uh, it's what's known as the fallacy of the last move. Lots of things in life make sense if you get to be the one to make the last move. And the reason it's a fallacy, of course, is because the sun rises tomorrow every day, so somebody else is always taking the next move. Um, so you, know, you, you can put all of this in, in this context. So what are the um, second order effects that well, come from the companies doing all the encryption? It's, it's where Jim Comey was pointing. You know, basically... Pass a law, say they can't. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had a law... Uh, well, let me say, before we had a law, the telephone system in the United States worked so there were party lines. Anybody could listen to anybody. Uh, you know, once that ceased to exist, you know, then the government needed to go get a wiretap order. And in order to effectuate a wiretap order, the government passed a law that said that if you were in the telephone business, you had to have the technical means to implement a wiretap order. It's a law that, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is called CALEA, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. Basically, for a number of years, the FBI has been concerned that they were going to go dark. You know, the concern is that as communications moves from traditional telephony, you know, to digital content, that there isn't a form of Kalia that reaches this next generation of content. And what's your view on that argument? Well, I, I, I think you'll see the tech sector resist that. I'll, but I'll also tell you, look, the tech sector resisted amendments. We argued against amendments in the British Parliament uh, this July. And the British Parliament strengthened uh, law enforcement's capability there after debating the bill for like four days. You know, legislative gridlock does not exist in the British Parliament, at least on those sets of issues. So, you know, I think you have to expect that this tug of war between technology and government never quite ends. Unless, and I think this is the unless we have to fo focus a little bit more on, unless you can build a new you know, at least consensus in, in the right quarters on how to strike the balance. If you go back to the principle I articulated at the beginning, that government should, should, through their laws, strike the balance. Well, that's ultimately where, where all of this leads. Ultimately, I think there's only two ways to better protect people's privacy, stronger technology or better laws. And you know, government officials that are not engaging in the discussion about how to adopt better laws you know, are then complaining when companies uh, you know, adopt stronger technology. It's like, look, we need to have a broader discussion. Yes. Uh, and it needs to bring everybody to the table so we can figure out how to strike the right balance. Yes. I'm anxious to get questions in, so let me just ask the last question, which I'm sure is a real easy and short one. Let's talk about the right to be forgotten. And um, it kind of follows on naturally because so far we've just been talking about surveillance and access to people's information. Something like the right to be forgotten is more about shaping the information that they see. Does your sort of thinking around jurisdiction and, and geographic uh, sovereign, sovereigns provide some path on right to be forgotten? I'm curious first how Microsoft has been handling it and second, does it mean that a search performed in Berlin maybe will have rightly different results because of different government regimes than a search performed in uh, New York? That's certainly potentially the, the outcome. Um, yeah, I think that the right to be forgotten decision by the European Court of Justice is extraordinarily important, but for frankly more reasons than most people are, are talking about today. First, of course, it's important because of the substantive uh, rule that is involved. You know, this tension between privacy and free expression. 
um, the different, I'll just say, cultural values that one encounters within different parts of the European Union, um, you know, are, are heartfelt by the people involved. I, I certainly appreciate that, you know, when I talk to people there. Um, you know, and yes, we are processing uh, requests where we have a legal obligation to comply. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's just not as many people in Europe that know about Bing. Uh, you know, so, <laughs> you know, the, the reality is, you know, in the United States, uh, Google has about 70% share. In Europe, it has about 95% share. Um, so that just recasts that aspect. But there's two other aspects of this decision that I think may well be more important from a longer term perspective. Second, the, the decision itself had two pieces. You know, one was about whether there was this right to be forgotten under European data protection laws that was uh, enacted in Spain. Frankly, the bigger issue really in the case was whether Google's search services were subject to Spanish law. You know, Google argued in the case that they were not subject to Spanish law because they did all of the data processing and they processed all the search results outside of Europe. Uh, and you know, even though we often process Bing results in a, in a similar way, frankly, we never took the position that we were you know, immune from European data protection law. I didn't think it had legs uh, legally. Um, you know, frankly, I thought it was going to create bad facts that would create bad law. Um, it didn't just seem like the right way to work with uh, European governments in a constructive manner. Um, but what happened is the European Court of Justice said that because Google has an establishment in Spain that markets its service in Spain, the fact that it processes the search results outside of Spain or outside of Europe is not enough to keep it outside of the application of European law. And anybody who knows uh, how you know, long-arm statutes evolved in the United States in the 1900s, you know, the 1800s, you know, it's frankly a similar trend. But there's another aspect of the case that I just think is really interesting. Generally, if you look at uh, technology and law over time and how they develop, you will find that a pattern in that courts play a more activist role. In periods of time when there was both rapid technological change and legislatures uh, show that they're not able to move very quickly. One, I could point to episodes in the 1800s with Congress and the Supreme Court, for example. And what we're seeing, of course, right now, is we're living in a time in the United States where you know, one of the defining trends of our time, polarization of, of politics, is leading to a gridlock Congress. And to a lesser but still important extent, one sees some of that in the European Parliament. One saw it in the Parliament that just ended over the last five years. There's lots of questions over the next five years. Will the European Parliament really be able to move legislation? So what are the two biggest changes of the law in 2014 when it comes to technology? I'd argue they both came from courts, not legislatures. One was the ECJ decision on the right to be forgotten. And there's certainly you know, discussion that you hear in certain quarters in, in Europe that point to you know, a sense that perhaps the just judges felt they needed to act because Parliament couldn't. The other big decision, it was the Supreme Court's decision in Riley v. California, you know, requiring unanimously you know, that the police get a search warrant to search a phone. And what I find so interesting about Riley v. California is two things. One, in a term where there were so many split decisions, that one was unanimous. And second, when you read that decision, I mean, I, I think what, what one often finds, you know, we've had a couple of cases before the Supreme Court. You have clerks who are so in touch with technology. You have justices who have a huge amount of practical experience and great wisdom and may not have as much day-to-day -day experience with technology. They have phones. Yeah, they have phones. <laughs> they do. And phones have become ubiquitous. And you see how sort of knowledge and wisdom came together, in my opinion, in that decision in a very profound uh, way. Um, but what I think it stands for, if you look at the next two years, we'll see what happens in the elections today. But in an era of gridlock, we should probably expect more judicial activism. Got it. Shailen, anything interesting going on to characterize on the Twitter stream, or is it uncharacterizable? Um, well, lots of, lots of quotes. People want to know where Hot Pants 15 is. <laughs> <laughs> we, we cannot say. 
I'm glad that wasn't, that didn't make the webcast actually, I think, so very good. Um, all right, uh, let's take a couple in-room questions. Just, uh, brevity is good. Hi, Jens Frankenreiter. I'm an LLM student at the law school. I have one question. Last month, uh, you, you have briefly touched, uh, touched on transparency. Last month, Twitter filed suit against the, the government in, in federal court. And what they basically want is they want to go beyond the terms of a settlement that you and another of other companies agreed upon in a, in a, in a formal lawsuit. Um, what is your take on that? Do you think, do you now regret having settled for the terms you got back in January? Or do you think this is a, this is a Twitter thing? They should go ahead. Um, it makes more sense for them. Um, what is your opinion? I don't regret the terms in which we settled. I understand and we're supportive of what Twitter is doing. And what Twitter is doing is, I think, important not just to Twitter, but it's, I'd say it's important to other smaller companies. And to just to give you the context, it's this. Um, when we filed our lawsuit last year, you know, frankly, the, one of the principal issues in the negotiation with the Justice Department concerned the range of these numeric buckets. In other words, we said we wanted to disclose the number of FISA orders and national security letters we were getting. You know, and what we ultimately settled on was buckets of 1,000 every six months. You know, so we put out our report, and we said that in the first half of 2014, you know, the number that we had received had been between 18,000 and 18,999. And I think that if you're a consumer who is using a broad-based, you know, well-established service you know, that comes from Microsoft or Google or Facebook, you know, we, we felt like that probably gave people enough to know this, the relative scale. You know, the smaller companies, the startups are saying, look, you know, just telling us to report that we're zero to 999 until suddenly someday we're 1,000 doesn't really tell the public very much. So they, they have, uh, have believed that they want a different bucket that is sliced more precisely. And uh, yeah, I can understand where they're coming from. And uh, I think that's why you see the tech sector united, uh, among other places, on Capitol Hill. Uh, in advocating for some additional steps that go in that direction. It's also a struggle, of course, to make it apples to apples. One request might be for a bunch of stuff, while a number of requests might be for a little bit of stuff. So it's yeah, hard well, we to do know try what to, to make Yeah, we, we try to capture how many user accounts are affected. All right, Otherwise, okay. you're right. Great. Bruce Schneier. So, uh, to me, one of the very hard things here is what you can and can't say. I mean, not you in particular, what companies can and can't say. I mean, comparing Stellar Wind, which is the email program the, that you talked about to start for the email collection of the NSA, and something like PRISM, which is going on today. In one case, you were forced to comply by law. In the other case was a request and you decided not to comply. In both cases, you were able to say nothing to, to the world, to the public. And when we're looking at rebuilding trust in tech, the hard part here is we don't know what you or anybody will, will, is saying in public that they are compelled to say. So it could certainly be that there exist these four or five programs, NSA, GCHQ, other, other countries, that you have to comply with by law, and you are compelled by law not to talk about them. And, and I don't have an answer here. What can we do to rebuild the trust where, in fact, the law undermines the tech. And earlier you said it's either law, fix the law or fix the tech. And you need that because either one can undermine the other. And we're now in a world where the law can undermine the tech. You can come up with this great tech bit locker, and you could be compelled by law to make bit locker bad and then not tell us. And, and we know that kind of thing has happened, and it certainly could happen. I mean, what are your thoughts on how we get beyond this? Well, first of all, I think you raise a really good point. And it addresses a really important issue. Um, and I'll say it is both uh, harder and, e and, uh, and maybe in a, uh, on occasion easier than, than you, you describe. Um, you know, the good news is, there, look, there's no law that compels us to say something affirmatively. Um, you know, but there are definitely laws that prohibit us from saying things we would like to say. So the, the, the gist of your point is, is spot one. And, and frankly, the, there's an aspect that's even more difficult um, than what your, your thought captured in that the way these things un unfold in the press, I mean, it, I have to say, I've dealt with a lot of legal issues in uh, the public sphere over the course of the last couple of decades, and I've never seen anything uh, like trying to respond to the, the, the disclosures of Snowden documents. Because you get a call from a reporter, it says, you know, we have a PowerPoint slide that says such and such. It's like, like we've never seen the slide. 
you know, the, the reporter can't talk to the person who created it. You know, we, we have to, can we get the slide? Um, we go to the government, you know, and, and then we say, hey, we, we've seen this slide. Or maybe we go to the government and say, can you show us the slide? Then we negotiate with the government. We'd like to say A, B, and C about this. And the government may say yes, the government may say no, but in all probability it's going to take three days to get an answer, and by then the story's been written and people are on to the next thing. So having an intelligible uh, you know, conversation about this is tough. I do think that there's another principle. If you just try to discern this to certain principles, you capture one that is just fundamental. You cannot restore trust without greater transparency. So then now the question is, how? I'm counting on you to fight for this. Yeah, exactly. I really am. Right, which is why you know, the first lawsuit that we filed was about transparency. Um, you know, it is, frankly, uh, you, know, it, you know, there are aspects of other issues where you know, some things have been unsealed. Um, we need a vigorous press, let me put it that way. We need a vigorous media um, that also fights for this and goes and asks for the unsealing of, of documents. Um, I think this is something where you know, we're, we as a company and we as an industry are going to need to do more, uh, and we're going to need more help from others too. It might ask whether for foreign intelligence gathering purposes especially, fact of secrecy should be removed. That if there's a program to do something, maybe that should be known, and yes, it will mean that the people scrutinized by it are going to have a little bit more of an advantage, just like a... Uh, criminal has an advantage or would be criminal knowing the intricacies of Supreme Court jurisprudence on the glove compartment versus the trunk versus under the seat. Take away hint, trunk, best place to store something. Um, <laughs> but we don't keep that kind of thing secret. Bruce, let me just... Uh, Can I just add about one other quick thing? Yes. This is why, in my opinion, the reform of the FISA court is so important. Yes. And, and this is an issue that uh, I think we should not al allow to get lost in the public discussion. You know, Senator Leahy has embraced this. Um, you know, there is an opportunity for Congress to move forward on this. I, I just think if you, even if we just recognize public safety is of course important, yes. but secret courts with secret decisions are not part of the American legal tradition. Go out on a limb. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, shouldn't, uh, right. we, we shouldn't accept that as an established part of what our constitutional yes. principles yes. guarantee. I guess at least we have the fact of the court now. Um, yeah, that's that, that, uh, Bruce wants ahead. like a 10-second right post, and then in the interest of a vigorous and aggressive press, David Sanger had a question, I think, from the New York Times. But. So, so very quickly, one way you can help with the transparency is it fight to tell us what happened between the NSA and Skype, because we don't know. Um, and you I mean, take that back. I'll take that back. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us what happened between the NSA and <laughs> Skype? We, <laughs> we could go another half not, hour if you not, want. Not in the last three minutes. Got it. We, David Sanger. Thanks very much. It's been a fascinating conversation. I wanted to take you back to Jonathan's questions about uh, the routinized encryption that we saw with the new operating system for the iPhone 6. We've also seen with BitLocker. Yeah. And what you seem to suggest, we'll eventually see when people figure it out how to do in the cloud. So the head of one of the major US intelligence agencies said to me just a few days ago, either we're going to work this out with the technology companies, or you're going to find in the next few years we are in an arms race with our own technology companies where they're routinizing encryption, and the United States government is boosting its efforts, which are already considerable, to break that encryption at incredibly high speed, so that this becomes more a speed bump to them than an, a real impediment. Is that where you think we are headed? I mean, is there, give us a sense of both the legal race versus the technological race. I, I think it's a great question, and I would go one step forward. You know, in the tug of war between uh, government and technology, the arms race has already started. It's not a question of whether we are going to have an arms race. The arms race has begun. Um, it, 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 one saw this last November when across the tech sector companies said that they were going to strengthen encryption. You know, that was the, the first theme we saw you know, in 2013. You know, 2014 is a, we're seeing a step towards device side encryption, and as long as 
the user community around the world wants more encryption, I think one needs to expect that tech companies are going to respond. The real issue is this. Now that we have an arms race, will we also have some arms control discussions? Or are we just going to have a tug of war? Um, there is no effective, broad-based conversation today that is, first of all, even bringing together the different parts of the United States government. Yeah, we, the U.S. government is overdue for an interagency uh, effort to look at the interests of the law enforcement intelligence agencies, bring of course, the Justice Department's considerations to the forefront, but also hear from the Commerce Department and from the State Department and, and others. And I hope that once the midterm elections are over, the White House can turn its attention to putting that kind of exercise in place. And of course, if the executive branch can you know, talk among itself more cohesively, you also create the foundation for a more cohesive conversation with the tech sector. Um, you know, I, I will say, I was at the, the, the White House last December um, when there were mostly CEOs, but 19 tech executives meeting with, with President Obama. Um, you know, I continue to believe that the person who understands the complexities of this issue as well or better than anyone else in the United States government, at least in the executive branch, is the President of the United States. Um, and the fact that we have a, a president right now who was a constitutional law professor, is a great asset to the country when it comes to addressing this issue. Um, but we do need more focus on this. We need, need to come together because in the absence of any real discussion, we're just going to have an arms race in perpetuity. And I'm not at all convinced that that is going to serve anybody uh, in the best possible way. It's interesting that if it is an arms race, it may be less an arms race on the cutting edge. You know, we'll go from 256-bit to 512-bit encryption or something, and more an arms race about the average in the middle. As my friend Larry Lessig likes to say, small fences can keep in large mammals. And the kind of default configuration when I walk up and establish an email account or sign up on a social network may govern freedom a lot more than when I'm really feeling paranoid and wanting to, uh, to lock everything uh, down. It also, of course, calls to mind the idea how much of this arms race will be software versus hardware. I think the minute it's hardware, it may be uh, now you've got a, a place to regulate because that's a physical object that's going to be shaped and can move. Uh, if it's all software, um, it's the kind of old 1990 Microsoft operating system that says anybody can write anything and you're entitled to double click on it. Uh, that, that calls to mind a form of uh, both innovation and uh, chaos that we see maybe less and less these days. Anyway, we're at time right now. Um, please join me, Harvard Law School, the Journal on Law and Technology, and the Berkman Center in thanking Brad Smith for spending the past hour. Thank you.